So I have a, a definition of narcissism that's a little different from other people's. Normally we think of a narcissist as someone who loves themselves. And I'm actually saying that a narcissist is a person who doesn't love themselves sufficiently. Mm. So in order to get through life, we have to have a degree of self-esteem. We have to think that we're worthy of certain things. We have to have a sense of inner worth. If we don't have that kind of bedrock from within, we constantly need attention and validation from other people, right? I need attention, I need to stir trouble, I need to feed my ego. I can't get it from myself, I have to get it from other mm, people. Mm -hmm. That's a classic, what I call a deep narcissist. And that's why they cause so many problems in life. And I measure it. I say, imagine it like a water line. And here at the top is someone who's not a narcissist. Here at the middle is kind of an average person. And as you sink deeper into narcissism, you're more and more self-absorbed. You can never get up to that mid-level point where you can start thinking about other people. At the high point, you're someone who's very empathetic. You're able to get inside the mind of other people. You understand their moods, their emotions. Most of us fall at that range of maybe 60%, 50 being the middle line. We have moments of narcissism where we get self-absorbed, particularly if we have problems and we, we, we turn inward. But then we have enough self-esteem because of our parents and because of our background that we raise ourselves back up and we don't keep continually sinking into that narcissism. We want to get higher, we want to get to that level where we're able to be more empathetic. A deep narcissist has sunk so far below that they can never get up to even to that halfway point. They're so self-absorbed, they're so insecure, they constantly must stir up trouble, they need to be the center of attention. If to be the center of attention means to create a great work of art, that's fine. But sometimes to be the center of attention means to mess with people, to create problems, to stir up trouble, and to be the, at the center of that. Once somebody is at that level, like a 20 or a 30, and these are just arbitrary numbers, sure. there's nothing that's gonna raise them back up. That's who they are. There's nothing they can do. There's almost nothing other people can do. They are, um, they are uh, what's the word? They're damaged goods. Where does it come from? It comes from the fact that when we were children, we had a lot of attention, most of us, not all of us, had a lot of attention from our parents. And then a point is reached when we're four years old, maybe a little earlier, where they start withdrawing that attention because they realize we have to be independent, because they have other siblings to attend to, because they have other things. So you're not getting that intense attention that you got from the mother or even the father early on. And for, it's a very painful moment you have to start to learn to be independent. And the process that we go through is we develop a self, an image of ourselves. It's almost like you're looking at yourself and it's projected on a wall. And that self has good qualities. You love that self. It has, you know, it has things that you're comfortable with. It has certain tastes and desires that you, who you are, and you like that. And so in those moments, when you feel pain, when you feel abandoned, when you don't feel you get your attention, you are able to withdraw into yourself and not feel so bad. You're able to get the love from yourself. You don't depend it on other people. You're not aware of that process because it all happened unconsciously. But psychologists have demonstrated, have cataloged it. It's, very, it's a very real phenomenon. And so slowly, unconsciously, you develop this idea of yourself, this kind of ideal version of who you are. And as you get older, this tendency gets stronger and stronger. You like other people who share your own values. You like other people who flatter you. You like people who like you. These are all signs of your self-absorption, of your narcissism. There's nothing negative about it. Stop judging yourself. Every single person you know has these tendencies. Some people are what I call deep narcissists. And they had a childhood that was different. They come usually from some, maybe a broken home. There are two things where things can become dysfunctional. A, the parent neglects them or is abusive and the, and the love and affection that they expect is actually the opposite. All right, so they're not able to develop that self that is able to love because they feel they actually hate themselves. Or B, the parent overwhelms them with attention and suffocates them to the point where they're not able to develop an independent self. Either way, that, that self image that we come to love isn't, is, is aborted, it doesn't, it doesn't grow, it's not organic. And so when the child reaches 
of five or six years old, in those moments of pain when they're not getting the love they need, instead of turning inward, they have to do turn outward. They have to become a performer. They have to act out to get attention. They have to throw a tantrum. They have to be extremely dramatic. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that drama is very exciting. We've seen children like that who are always performing. They're very cute. They're very charming. They know how to get attention through their wit, through their antics, right? Okay. But it comes, it, it can come from an inner emptiness. They're acting out. They have to. It's the only way they can get the love and attention they need. So we naturally, I call us functional narcissists. We're able to function in this world. We're narcissists, but we can function well. And we're normally at that halfway point. Sometimes we rise above because we're very interested in people. Maybe we fall in love or maybe because of work, we really have to focus on people. We can rise to 60 to 70, but then when we're depressed, we kind of go down and we get more self-absorbed. We go down to 30 and 40. But that thermostat will raise us up so that we never get too self-absorbed because we'll pay a price for that. Deep narcissists can never get above that mark. They're always down below. They don't have that thermostat. They're always locked inside of themselves. And as they get older, they have to become more and more dramatic to get that attention. Mm -hmm. Now, that could become a very positive trait or it seemed to be because it, it can be charismatic, right? So you learned as a child when you were five or six years old to be very dramatic to get attention. Now imagine you've been doing that for 20, for 15, 17 years and you're in your 20s. You're like a master at getting attention, right? Mm -hmm. And you have this kind of energy where I need love from you people. I need love from you. And it's very seductive. And people will give you that loving energy. You're a, you're a master at magnet at attracting that energy, right? But it comes from an inner emptiness. And at some point, it can turn against you. Um, you have to realize the worst thing is to take everything personally and get emotional. Mm -hmm. So people who are psychotic bosses, their power is in grabbing your emotions and entangling you in, the, in, in, a, in a drama. They're better at it. They're more aggressive. They're nastier. They're more difficult. They're more amoral than you are. You're never going to win playing to their strengths. They thrive on, on, on making you emotional. Mm. So you have to learn in general in life to stop taking things so emotionally. Now, it's not everything. I do want you to fall in love and have a family and love your children, etc. But in the work world, it pays to cool things down and to not real to realize that it is never personal. So when you're facing this person, this boss, um, your tendency is to think is to take it personally, to think their anger and their um, difficultness and their aggression is directed at you that there's something about you they don't like or whatever it's never about you personally never hardly ever people who are like this they're reenacting dramas from their own troubled childhood um, they have terrible issues um, they're reliving things from their horrible father or their mean narcissistic mother or whatever it was generally from very early in childhood, maybe a little bit later, and you're the target. They're just simply replaying their old dramas with new actors. It's not personal. It has nothing to do with you. Don't take it personally. See them for what they are. Understand um, that they are twisted people with some kind of issues. And I, I talk about what these various issues are. I, I go into it into all the different types of horrible people that there are in this world. And there are, there are a good many types of them, from the passive aggressive, to the, the narcissist, uh, to the control freak, to all those types, you know? Knowledge will, will re liberate you. Knowing that this is what is motivating them, all right, now I have options. I don't have to react, I don't have to get emotional. I can retreat, I can withdraw, I can play certain games on them that'll, in, if you want to infuriate them and imbalance them so they'll leave you alone, 
You have more than enough material to do that. You have deterrent strategies from deterring them from being aggressive. You have options when you have knowledge. The other thing is you cut them down to size. You see them as the little child stomping their feet. Um, in the war book, uh, I'm having to read, uh, Joseph Stalin is sort of my quintessence of the awful psychotic boss. There's nobody worse in history than Joseph Stalin. Imagine you have a boss that if you anger, you're sent to the gulag and you're going to die. So you have a boss that is holding life and death over you. He's terrible. He's horrible. I talk in war about Shost the, the great Russian composer Shostakovich, um, who suddenly is meeting face to face with Stalin. He's so intimidating. He's got this look where he's just like, people were like, I'm so serious. People would literally shit in their pants <laughs> when he looked at them at this certain way. Because mm -hmm. they knew he, he, he looked at them that way. They're going to go, they're going to the gulag. They're going to die. Yeah, life is on the line. Their life is on the line. Yeah. He gave that look to Shostakovich. Basically, this other person that was in the meeting was saying, uh, Stalin was, was upset because this was a meeting about um, who was going to compose the new national anthem for the Soviet Union after World War II. And Shostakovich had written something, and Kachaturian and something, and Stalin was critiquing these people, and this one, guy, and, and he was critiquing this one man's orchestration, and the man said, "Well, you know what? I actually didn't orchestrate it. This other guy did." And Shostakovich was realizing he just signed the death warrant for that young man who did the orchestration by saying that he did the faulty orchestration. It literally was going to mean that. So Shostakovich. In a, in a flash, realized that it didn't fall for Stalin's intimidation game. He saw him as a little child, as a six-year-old boy with a, a philandering father and a mother who beat him in an awful childhood, and he cut him down to size. I'm not intimidated by this man. He does not intimidate me. And in that moment, he had presence of mind, and he said, oh, such and such, your, your, your orchestrator is a very fine orchestrator. You shouldn't blame him. Um, you know, you should do your own orchestration from now on. He sort of saved the situation. Mm. But the mental process was he cut this person down to size. He didn't fall for the myth. He saw them as a human being with temper tantrums, with issues etc. When you fall for the myth, when you start real, thinking that they're greater than they are, when you start trembling, when your mm. bowels start moving from fear, you're in their grasp. When you're reasonably calm, you maintain your presence of mind, you see them as a little baby that's throwing a tantrum uh, or whatever it is, you've got some control and you have options. If we're talking about strategy, the number one um, strategic principle that I say is the most important of all is the person who has options has more options than the one who will win in a comp competitive situation. If you only have one option um, you're generally under the control of your opponent but if you create a situation where you're there and you can go here, here, here or here that means you can react in the moment and you can take the path that might be the best for that situation. You always want options. And when you get emotional, when you react, when you get caught in their drama, you have only one option, anger. Um, you're, you start repeating in your mind the same thing mm -hmm. over and over and over again. You've lost, you've yeah. already lost. When you're calm and you can, you can not say anything, you can quit, you can be a toady for a few moments, but not really feel like you're, that's who you are. All right, you can choose. You're in control. And that asshole boss is not in control because you have options. I have a story, actually a story that got cut from the book. If you got my bonus material, if you pre-order The Laws of Human Nature, you get some bonus material. There's a story I cut that I give you about Robert Oppenheimer, the physicist who was a deep narcissist who managed to kind of cure himself. And the way he cured himself was through work. Instead of absorbing himself in, in getting attention, he put all of his energy into the Manhattan Project 
and into later becoming a, a great physicist, um, sort of a public figure. He turned against uh, nuclear arms, etc. Um, he sort of cured himself. You can perhaps cure yourself through your work, through getting out of this, getting your attention through what you achieve rather than through what you stir up from other people. But generally, once you get down past that, that, that low level, there's nothing you can do because you're addicted to, you're addicted to getting attention from other people.